Hello, welcome to Meep's Math Matters. This is Meep, and today I'm talking about election math. Just an election in the United States, and also there was one in Canada recently. So we might want to be interested in how voting systems work, especially since they're not fair. And before you could start screaming about cheating and, oh yes, I knew it was always stacked against people, I'm talking about it's not fair in a mathematical sense. Kenneth Arrow won the 1972 economics, Nobel Prize of Economics for showing that there is no such thing as a fair voting system. And let me show you what he meant, what he defined as fair, and then we'll see how some common voting systems fail uh, these fairness critiques. In defining our fair voting system, I'm going to use a non-controversial example. Well, I hope it's non-controversial. Instead of picking between, say, laws or politicians, we're going to be picking between pizzas. So here I have anchovy, broccoli, cheese, um, and I have dot, dot, dot to indicate there may be other choices. The idea is that we have a group of people, each person, so say you have person one, Person one has certain preferences. They prefer A to B to C and so forth. Person two might prefer B to A to C, that kind of thing, and so forth. And the idea is that we're going to take these individual preferences and map this. So your vote is going to be the preferences. And we're going to map this somehow to some overall group or societal preference. Okay, so maybe we'll get A, B, C. So the idea is that at the end of the day, we're going we're gonna to pick one pizza type, say. Uh, we're ordering one pizza. And so we need to find, as a group, a way to choose this. And we need to agree on what would constitute a fair way of choosing the pizza type. Let's look at Kenneth Arrow's definition of a fair voting system. First, you need universality, and what that means is every possible preference uh, ordering can be input into the voting system. So you cannot have, to give you an example, you can't have a situation where it says, no, we are not going to allow you to prefer anchovies to broccoli to cheese. We're just not going to allow that. So first of all, all possibilities have to be allowed, and then second of all, it needs to be deterministic. If I give you the inputs, you need to tell me a unique and unique, no, a unique uh, result for that set of inputs. So that just makes sense from what we think of as a voting system. We've got to allow every possible kind of vote and we need to make sure that we know what the, you know, this is not, no coin tosses, you know, no coin tosses. Obviously this happens in real life, coin tosses, when you have to break a tie sometimes. Um, another one, non- imposition. Okay, so this sounds fancy. What this means is every possible preference ordering can be an output. So again, this is in the first one, every possible input, and there needs to be a way to get any possible output. So you can't tell me that this system is not going to allow an anchovy over broccoli over cheese choice. Okay, so again, this, this kind of makes sense um, in that we want to make sure that there is no predetermined choice such that, say, one of the choices can never be on top. Okay, so that's just coming from an idea of a fair voting system. Now, let's look at the three other ones that have to do with fairness, non-dictatorship. So that means there does not, basically everybody has input. does not mean everybody has equal effect on the outcome. But what this means is there cannot be a single voter that is going to determine what the result is going to be. Now, let me show you a voting system that's in real life. It's called block voting. Also known in the US, you have electoral college voting. And the block voting, or block with just a C, you can have a dictatorship set up. So say you had three voters, voter one, voter two, voter three, and they had different number of votes. 
So say voter number one gets five votes, voter number two gets one, and voter number three gets one. Well, this isn't going to work because no matter what happens, voter number one is going to dominate. Voter number one is a dictator under a majority rules situation. No matter two and three can't get together to vote together and, and gang up on number one, this is a dictatorship voter voting system. There are f two further concepts of what a fair voting system is, and one is monotonicity, and this means that you should have an individual voter can't game their vote, meaning they cannot rank something higher than they want to in order to switch the preferences, and I'll show that in a moment, and independence of irrelevant alternatives. So let me show you what that means. Say instead of A, B, and C, so you have all your votes for A, B, and C. So if we find that one of the choices goes away, say B goes away, it shouldn't matter if B is there or not in the final ranking you should end up with the same ordering. What I mean by this, so let's say there were seven people who per have prefer A to B to C. Six people prefer B to C to A, and five people prefer C to e A to B. Well, in a regular majority rules voting, so let's say you are voting your top preference, so here seven people would vote A, six people would vote B, and five people would vote C, then A would win. However, if we got rid of the choice of B, then we would end up with seven people voting for A and 11 vote people voting for C. So if we remove the alternative of B, then the result changes. So this is, this is a big problem with a lot of voting systems is this can happen. And a lot of people say that you get spoilers in certain elections where you get this kind of cyclical um, preferences and someone will add a third choice in and it will change who the winner of the game is, the, the winner of the election. So now let's look at something where monotonicity is violated. One voting system that violates monotonicity is instant runoff voting. And the way instant runoff voting is this works is this. You put in your entire order of preferences on your ballot and then they count up all the first choices. And if nobody gets more than 50% of the first choice, then you drop whoever got the lowest, lowest number and you keep doing this until you get a majority winner. So let's look at this example. There's 17 votes total here. So these numbers six, two, three, four, and two are the number of votes for each of these preferences. And nobody gets enough first preference votes. So um, the one with the least number is B. So B is gonna get dropped. And once B is dropped, you'll find that there are nine votes for C as the first preference, so C is going to win. Okay, however, let's look at these last two people who prefer A to C to B. And let's say they, they bump up their preference so that C is greater than A is greater than B. So those two votes are going to be added on to the C is greater than A is greater than B. Again, nobody gets enough votes as first preference. So this time though, B is not on the bottom, A is on the bottom. So A is dropped. And once A is dropped, you find that there are nine votes for B and then B will win. What's wrong here is that you have two voters who have bumped up their preference for C and in doing so change C from a winner to a loser, and that just shouldn't work. That's not how we think of a rational voting process. You shouldn't hurt a candidate, you shouldn't hurt a pizza choice. By increasing the preference, it should be more likely that it wins. And yet in this case, it will lose just because two voters have bumped up their preference for C. So instant runoff voting, uh, violating monotonicity is a real problem. Anyway, as always, I can be contacted at marypat.campbell at gmail.com and remember to spread the math love.